Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Is the Bible God's Word? Start of Chapter 9 The Genealogy of Jesus Watch now how the Christian fathers have foisted the incestuous progenies of the Old Testament upon their Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ in the New Testament. For a man who had no genealogy, they have manufactured one for him. And what a genealogy! Six adulterers and offsprings of incest are imposed upon this holy man of God, men and women deserving to be stoned to death according to God's own law, as revealed through Moses, and further to be ostracized and debarred from the house of God for generations. Ignoble Ancestry Why should God give a father, Joseph, to his son Jesus? And why such an ignoble ancestry? This is the whole of beauty of it, says the pervert. God loved the sinner so much that he disdaineth not to give such progenitors for his son. Only two commissioned. Of the four gospel writers, God inspired only two of them to record the genealogy of his son. To make it easy for you to compare the fathers and grandfathers of Jesus Christ in both the inspired lists, I have culled the names only, minus the verbiage. Between David and Jesus, God inspired Matthew to record only 26 ancestors for his son. But Luke also inspired, gathered up 41 forefathers for Jesus. The only name common to these two lists between David and Jesus is Joseph, and that too a supposed father according to Luke chapter 3 verse 23. This one name is glaring. You need no fine tooth comb to catch him. It is Joseph the carpenter. You will also easily observe that the lists are grossly contradictory. Could both the lists have emanated from the same source, that is God? Fulfilling prophecy? Matthew and Luke are overzealous in making David the king, the prime ancestor of Jesus because of that false notion that Jesus was to sit on the throne of his father David. Acts chapter 2 verse 30 The Gospels belie this prophecy, for they tell us that instead of Jesus sitting on his father's David's throne, it was Pontius Pilate, a Roman governor, a pagan who sat on that very throne and condemned its rightful heir, Jesus, to death. Never mind, says the evangelist. If not in his first coming, then in his second coming he will fulfill this prophecy and three hundred others beside. But with their extravagant enthusiasm to trace the ancestry of Jesus physically to David, for this is actually what the Bible says, that of the fruit of his David's loins, according to the flesh, literally, not metaphorically, Acts chapter 2 verse 30, both the inspired authors trip and fall at the very first step. Matthew chapter 1 verse 6 says that Jesus was the son of David through Solomon. But Luke chapter 3 verse 31 says that he, Jesus, was the son of David through Nathan. One need not be a gynecologist to tell that by no stretch of the imagination could the seed of David reach the mother of Jesus both through Solomon and Nathan at the same time. We know that both the authors are confounded liars, because Jesus was conceived miraculously, without any male intervention. Even if we concede a physical ancestry through David, both authors would still be proved liars for the obvious reason. Breaking Prejudice As simple as the above logic is, the Christian is so emotionally involved that it will not penetrate his prejudiced mind. Let us give him an identical example, but one where he can afford to be objective. 
We know from history that Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the son of Abraham alayhi salam through Ishmael alayhi salam. So if some inspired writer came along and tried to palm off his revelation to the effect that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the son of Abraham alayhi salam through Isaac alayhi salam, we would, without any hesitation, brand such a writer as a liar. Because the seed of Ibrahim alayhi salam could never reach Amina, Muhammad's mother, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through Ishmael alayhi salam, and through Isaac alayhi salam at the same time. The differences of lineage between these two sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam is the difference between the Jews and the Arabs. In the case of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we would know then that anyone who says that Isaac alayhi salam is his progenitor was a liar. But in the case of Jesus, both Matthew and Luke are suspect. Until the Christians decide which line of ancestors they prefer for their God, both Gospels will have to be rejected. Christendom has been battling tooth and nail with these genealogies for the past 2000 years, trying to unravel the mystery. They have not given up yet. We admire their perseverance. They still believe that time will solve the problem. Perhaps another 2000 years? There are claimed contradictions that theologians have not resolved to every atheist's satisfaction. There are textual difficulties with which scholars are still wrestling. Only a Bible illiterate would deny these and other problems. The Plain Truth, July 1975. The source of Luke's inspiration. We have already nailed 85% of Matthew and Luke to Mark or that mysterious cue. Let us now allow Luke to tell us who inspired him to tell his most excellent Theophilus. Luke chapter 1 verse 3, the story of Jesus. He tells us plainly that he was only following in the footsteps of others who were less qualified than himself. Others who had the temerity to write accounts of his hero Jesus as a physician, as against fishermen and tax collectors. He was no doubt better equipped to create a literary masterpiece. This he did because it seemed good to me also so to put in order. These are his prominent justifications over his predecessors. In the introduction to his translation of the Gospel of St. Luke, a Christian scholar, J.B. Phillips, has this to say. On his own admission, Luke has carefully compared and edited existing material. But it would seem that he had access to a good deal of additional material, and we can reasonably guess at some of the sources from which he drew. And yet you call this the word of God? Obtain the Gospels in modern English, in soft cover by Fontana Publications. It is a cheap edition. Get it quickly before the Christians decide to have Philip's invaluable notes expunged from his translation. And do not be surprised if the authors of the RSV also decide to eliminate the preface from their translation. It is an old, old habit. As soon as those who have vested interests in Christianity realize that they have inadvertently let the cat out of the bag, they quickly make amends. They make my current references past history overnight. The remaining gospel. Who is the author of the gospel of St. John? See what he says about himself in John chapter 19 verse 35 and chapter 21 verses 24 and 25. Who is his he and his and this and his we know and I suppose. Could it be the fickle one who left him in the lurch in the garden, when he was most in need, or the fourteenth man at the table at the Last Supper, the one that Jesus loved? Both were John's. It was a popular name among the Jews in the time of Jesus, and among Christians even now. Neither of these two was the author of this gospel. That it was the product of an anonymous hand is crystal clear. Authors in a nutshell. Let me conclude this authorship search with the verdict of those 32 scholars backed by their 50 cooperating denominations. 
God had been eliminated from this authorship race long ago. In the RSV by Collins, invaluable notes on the books of the Bible are to be found at the back of their production. I am reproducing only a bit of that information here. We start with Genesis, the first book of the Bible. The scholars say about its author, one of the five books of Moses. Note the words five books of Moses are written in inverted commas. This is a subtle way of admitting that this is what people say, that it is the book of Moses, that Moses was its author. But we, the 32 scholars who are better informed, do not subscribe to that title tattle. The next four books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Author? Generally credited to Moses. This is the same category as the book of Genesis. Who is the author of the book of Judges? Answer? Possibly Samuel. Who is the author of Ruth? Answer? Not definitely known and who is the author of First Samuel? Answer, author unknown. Second Samuel. Answer, author unknown. First King. Answer, author unknown. Second King. Answer, author unknown. First Chronicles. Answer, author unknown, probably. Second Chronicles. Answer, author likely collected. And so the story goes. The authors of these anonymous books are either unknown or are probably or likely or are of doubtful origin. Why blame God for this fiasco? The long-suffering and merciful God did not wait for 2,000 years for Bible scholars to tell us that he was not the author of Jewish peccadillos, prides and prejudices, of their lusts, wranglings, jealousies and enormities. He said it openly what they do. And woe to those who write the book with their own hands. And then say, this is from Allah, to traffic with it for a miserable price. So woe to them for what their hands do write, and woe to them for what they earn thereby. Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, Chapter 2, Verse 79 We could have started the thesis of this book with the above Quranic verse and ended with it, with the satisfaction that God Almighty had himself delivered his verdict on the subject is the Bible God's word. But we wish to afford our Christian brethren an opportunity to study the subject as objectively as they wished, allowing believing Christians, reborn Christians, and their own holy book and the Bible to testify against their better judgment. What about the Holy Quran? Is the Quran the word of God? The author of this humble publication has endeavored to answer this question in a most scientific manner in his book, Al-Qur'an, The Miracle of Miracles. End of chapter 9 End of Is the Bible God's Word?